大家好，今天是 Dr. Austin 给我们做的第三期关于 College Application 的讲座。第一期我们做了中呃亚洲学生 Ten Strategy How to Apply for Elite College for Asian Students, right? Yeah. 第二期我们做了怎样写一个 essay， 十十种特特别的方法。这一期我们主要讲一下 Two Thousand。Sixteen, the application. In the M A. 然后今年 two two thousand seventeen strategy. 然后我们再回答一下 E A E D 的 how to evaluate. 那我们这里有二十二个 question. 谢谢大家的时间。但是呢，我们会看时间，然后选择比较重要的。Welcome, Dr. Austin. Hello, it's a great privilege to be here. I've been asked to speak on three things about three things. One, how the how Asian Americans did in 2016 for Ivy League schools, top schools. Secondly, strategies for junior and senior parents and children to get into college. And the third is what's better.、Um, talk a little bit about early decision and early action. I'm also going to talk about the no, new coalition.、Um, Application, which is specifically for top schools, 54 now use it. It's going to eventually have 80. I'm going to talk about that and answer some questions. First of all, I'm going to talk about good news and bad news. I'm writing a book called The Sticky College App. Sticky means that you stand out, that it, it, your application doesn't just slip by, and it's about how to get in and how to get money and how to have a better high school experience. So my particular students did very well. I got students into Dartmouth, Princeton, Columbia,、um, Bowden,、um, Northwestern, Stanford. You know all the top schools. And I'm going to talk about how I did it. And these were Asians that got in. But first of all, I want to talk about the situation of Asians today getting into Ivy League. First of all, there's a very interesting article that you should all read. No longer separate, not yet equal. Race and class and elite college admission and campus life. This is very, very important because it talks about how there is definitely a, a quota system for Asians. The average. Um, there are over 30 percent of admissions to top schools are Asians, and only 16.5 percent get in. This average has not changed in the last 10 years.、Um, so, a little background. Just using Harvard as an example, in the early 20th century, Jews were kept out. There was a quota where only 15. 10 to 15 percent Jews were allowed to go in. However, by 1927, there was a lot of pressure to allow Jewish people to go in, and so they raised it <clears throat> at that time to about 24 percent. That happened for a couple of years, and then it went back to 15 percent. This article talks about Asian Americans being the new Jews. This is neither American nor is it fair. You cannot look at students getting into Ivy League without a Understanding this, because you're playing against the quota as well as competing against other Asians. Now, currently, Harvard has 20 percent Asian Americans. Stanford has 22 percent,、uh, but that's just recently. Most of the schools are 12 percent, 14 percent, and it's because pressure was put on Harvard, if you remember. So, what I'm going to talk about is two things. One about the reality. So here's a very important thing for every Asian American thinking to do: you need to join SFA. SFA is a、um, organization that fights affirmative action. Affirmative action keeps Asians out and lets blacks and Hispanics in. I'm not against blacks and Hispanics going to college. What I am against is that Asian Americans are kept out, and you have to understand this. This is very, very important to understand. For instance, Asians applying to highly selective private colleges face, face odds against their admission three times as high as whites, six times, six times as high as Hispanics, and sixteen times as high as blacks. To put it another way, Asians need SAT scores 140 points higher than every white. 
270 points higher than Hispanics, and an incredible 450 points higher than blacks out of 1,600 points. So an Asian application with an SAT score of 1,500, that is, has the same chance of being accepted as a white student with 1,360, a Latino with 1,230, or an African American with 1,050. Among candidates in the highest 1,400 to 1,600 SAT range, 77% of blacks, 48% of Hispanics, 40% of whites, and only 30% of Asians are accepted. <clears throat> this is extremely important. This is a fact. The sun goes up, the sun goes down. There is a quota for Asians. Now, the only place where there is not a quota, interestingly enough, is in California because we passed 209 in 1996, and that's at Caltech and all of the UCs. This is why Caltech has 40% Asian Americans and why the UCs has 40% or more. And in fact, they're in the majority at Cal Berkeley and they're in the majority at UCLA. This is extremely important to understand. The rest of the 49 states do not honor this, okay? Please understand that. They continue with quota. So the, there's two things that we can do. This is a good news. You could join Students for Fair Admissions, SFA, which is an advocacy group representing Asian Americans and other students rejected by top colleges that employ racial preferences. These colleges, these Ivy League universities, will always deny it but they use quotas, okay? Again, the average is 16%. So the good news is, since the reality is that you're going to have to, you know, be political, stand up, fight back, sue, until this is changed legally. It's the only reason it changed for blacks. Only reason it changed for Hispanics, okay? It's got, the Asian Americans have to get together and do it, all right? You're thinking of your children. But the second thing is, the good news is, Right now, you can learn how to play the game better. I have been working with Asian Americans for the last 24 years. One of the things that I do is do a Myers-Briggs test. That's M-Y-E-R-S-Briggs, B-R-I-G-G-S. What this is is a preference test. It's a personality psychological test. And I use it helps me find good colleges for students and get to know them better. For the Asian Americans I've worked with, they are, on the whole, absolutely, I-S-T-J, which means they're introverts, they're sensates, they're thinkers, and they're judges. They're focused on the mind. The people that are their judges are me, E-N-F-P, extrovert, intuitive, feeling, perception, the mind. And that's why I'm going to give you some very, very simple principles that will really help you. And you have to believe me, this works. You can have a 1550. You can have a 4.8. You can play the piano endlessly and get the highest certificate, and you won't get into one Ivy League, okay? Because something else is in play. So here's the first simple principle. You prepare, you prepare for college with your mind but you get into the college with your heart, okay? Who got into Stanford, Yale, and Princeton? A Korean girl, student, with 1,500 SATs, 800 on her math and subject in Mandarin, a 4.6 average, president of National Honor Society in her suburban high school, a member of the Key Club and Interact, these are volunteer clubs, along and along, believe it or not, with six other Asian students, helped map the genome project. An extraordinary thing, okay? Or this other girl, a 4.2 student, the Korean had 4.2, of six, with 1,400 SATs, the Korean girl had 1,500. This particular student has 700s in math and Spanish. And she participated in a, in a wonderful group called Girls Who Code. And she came back to her, for the summer, she came back to her inner, city high, her inner city high school and started a developers club for girls at her school. Got the school to participate in the Hour of Code 
and the Congressional App Program and actually got a, an award from the program and volunteered in their middle school to do the same thing. What school did each one? The Korean girl got into Caltech, Cal, UCLA, UCSD, but not one Ivy League. The Hispanic girl got into Stanford, Brown, and Yale. What's the difference? The Hispanic girl had a quota in her favor and a story. She made a significant difference at her school, whereas the Korean girl had a list of really excellent things, but that isn't enough. So you start with those quotas, and you start with lists don't work. Okay, here's a, the next simple one. By the way, this was a it's not the first school you get into, but the last. The Korean girl went on to become a Rhodes Scholar and got her MBA from Harvard. So it's not the first school, it's the last school. There's always a workaround. Number two, another simple problem. You don't apply to college, your story applies, right? And it depends on the significance of your story. And it is something that you work on from the eighth grade on, okay? This seems like common sense, because you know... You don't actually apply. Your application applies, and it is your story, okay? I understand that. But what, but we think we matter when we apply. We think we're going to get in because of our good lists. We think our teachers, counselors know us and will do a good job presenting us, even though, even though they are averaging 25 recommendations a person, a piece, and, took, and we only took one class from them. And the, the counselor has 350 in order, public school, in order to get into an Ivy League, you need a recommendation like this. In the last 10 years, this is the best student I've ever, you need a rave, okay? Remember, UCs don't have any recommendations. UCs don't have a quota system. UCs look at GPA and um, SAT, ACTs first, but not Ivy Leagues. If you're in a private school, not a public high school, and you're not a superstar, it's even worse. We think we've done enough if our children are well-rounded. They get excellent grades. They get excellent SATs. They play the piano or tennis. They've joined clubs and are treasurers and belong to Key Club or Boy Scouts or serve at the church. But colleges want one-pointed students. They want students who have a theme, but it's not just a theme. It's a significant theme. It's what difference did you make at your school? This is the biggest thing that is keeping Asians out of Ivy League. I work with many Asians. It is de rigueur, regular, that they have 1,500 on their SATs. They always have 800 on the math, okay? And their GPAs are fantastic with the rigor. What I work on is the heart that they have made a significant difference in other people's lives, not just join clubs, not just put in some hours at the library or Red Cross, but have really learned as a human being to grow. And I'll talk more about it. We think that if our siblings got in by doing the usual, or the kid last year, or because our aunt graduated there, that we have an edge, it's not true. Today, in California, over one million kids apply. Okay, let me give you an example of UCLA had 80,000 students apply. Stanford had 42,000. It takes 4%. Okay, Harvard had 40,000, and it takes 6%. Yet we think they're going to see us. We think because we've been special in our high school and we've minded our mothers and we've gotten the high grades that they're going to notice us. And we are special. You know, we do matter to ourselves and our family and our friends, but not to the Office of Admission. We have to shape our story so that they can see us here so it's sticky. How do we, in a crowd of, say, 40,000 students who apply, reach out and grab their hand so they listen and hear us and want us? And notice how I'm saying that, grabbing their hand. In other words, somehow we're sticky. We don't just slip by. I have read, I have read so many admissions um, dossiers in which they say, good, excellent student, rigorous classes, introvert, 
is certainly has good character, has high SATs, but no different from maybe 20,000 other kids that have applied, okay? In addition, um, it's even worse for high-achieving Asian students who not only have to compete in the overall with huge number of students and the quotas, but you're also competing with kids in your own school. So let's say you're a feeder school that routinely gets one or two at Stanford, but you have 12 kids that are applying. You have to stand out from those kids in order to get in, okay? So it can be very, very daunting, but what I'm going to talk about is what you can do. Is The next one was you don't apply. Um, your story applies. And your story must be significant, okay? Who would you pick? A 4.5 male who has a GPA, who has top certificates in piano, varsity, is president of the math club, volunteers playing piano at the senior center, and is a counselor and tutor at the math and computer science camp for Asian kids, or a 3.8 student who not only plays the flute in his orchestra, a marching band, and the San Francisco Youth Orchestra, but teaches flute to disadvantaged kids, started and started a high school club to do that, and that club has grown to 25 members. He has to train the students how to teach disadvantaged students to play flute. It's And he also started a wind ensemble with these kids to raise money for, the, for disadvantaged students. But above all, he's passionate about music and helping others through it. Okay? That's a difference between data, a 4.5 student who has a number 10 certificate, who's president of this and that, and volunteers in this and that, to someone who's passionate about music, who wants disadvantaged students to really play it, who raises the money, who gets his high school student. That's what I'm talking about with heart. Okay? So you apply... You prep for college with the mind. You apply for college with your heart. You don't apply for college. Your story does. And the story must show significance. Okay, so let me just go through that. Um, one of the things that I talk about is that your application is like a jigsaw puzzle. Who various things. They're looking for academic initiative. They're looking for initiative leadership. They're looking for students who make a difference, generosity, and they're looking for challenge and adversity. Let me explain something. When I first started out, I had a lot of students who had a lot of adversity, and it was really easy for me to find stories. Someone actually shot herself in the head when she was eight. You know, somebody else had a hair lip, and he went through 19 different um, operations, et cetera, et cetera. Today I have students that on the whole are from very good families. And if they have divorce in the family, divorce is so usual, we don't usually write about it. The challenge and adversity I'm talking about is someone that deliberately chooses to go to the next level. So in English, if you have an Asian student that does AP English, that's noticed. If you have a student who does not only calculus BC, but also does differentials, you know, online or, or um, at a community college, that's noticed. If you have a student who takes Spanish instead of Mandarin or Latin and goes to an AP, that's what we're talking about, rigor. Academic initiative means that you really challenge yourself, but it also means that you do um, math Olympics, that you do the math circle, that you do those online national math tests, that you um, um, do conferences, that you always are going to the next level. You know, one of the questions one of the parents asked for tonight is, how, you know, what is Stanford looking for? One of the typical things that Stanford looks for is national attention. So it's a national um, contest that you win or a competition in science. You go to that level. It's a very easy way um, for them to get your attention. Okay. Initiative is key, and real generosity is key. 
one of the things I work with a lot of kids that are Eagle Scouts. Now, having Asian students an Eagle Scout is very di- interesting and different. But an Eagle Scout, one of the things they do is they all do these projects. They're a big deal. It's not easy to become an e- Eagle Scout. But when they write about their project, it's always really boring because they do it just to finish the Eagle Scout, and it's not significant. When you have a student, if you just extrapolate that and look at a student that's doing Red Cross or doing the library or working at the Humane Society, they're doing it just for, or the food bank or the beach cleanup. They're doing it just for um, volunteer service. They're not growing. They're not being challenged. I had one student who worked at the St. Vincent de Paul here in Oakland, okay, And she loved it. She went in and she started working first for dinner. Then she really, this was a, Vincent DePaul here works with homeless women, gives them a place to shower and to eat some food and have their, and to do that with their children. And what she noticed was that as the mothers were getting clean and everything, the kids didn't have much to do. So she raised money to get them toys. She also really noticed that they were musical. And so she got toys that were musical toys. She also got together at her school three students that helped her. She became like a Pied Piper to get people interested in it, okay? And she made a huge difference in Vincent de Paul. And when she applied to college, the leader of St. Vincent de Paul wrote a stunning letter about how she, this 15-year-old kid, 16-year-old kid, helped really make a difference, okay? So the problem with they're, not, they're really good if you've got a, an office in it, but on the whole, just making them your volunteers are not, not enough because they're just bits and pieces, okay? Um, one of my students from Crystal Springs, an Asian student, he had a 4.4, um, his SATs were stunning. I had 1530. He had a couple of 800s on his subject tests. He was in the very um, difficult to get into madrigal uh, music. Um, and he was president of the math club. I, when he came to me, I said, and what does the math club do? And he said, well, we just meet. I said, well, Are you in the math circle? Do you support each other for tournaments? He said, not really. I said, if you want a chance at Stanford, you have got to take the math club and take it to another level. And he wrote a wonderful little essay, sophomores, when he was a senior, teaching other freshmen and sophomores a very difficult math problem that they were going to do at a term tournament. And he really felt very proud that he had really motivated kid, inspired kids to really want to go to the next level with math. He also, you know, what happens when you do an essay, you can sometimes do a close-up and really make us feel how something is rather than a long shot, which is just general. So tutoring is an example. Tutoring like the Red Cross, can be incredibly boring. You can't really write an essay. But this student wrote an essay about how he gently, consistently changed a kid's life. It was in East Palo Alto. This kid was an African-American, good in math, was behind in his, in his algebra. They asked if my student would go and work with him. He worked with one to algebra two. And he writes a wonderful essay about how he thought he'd be smarter than this kid. He was just helping him out. And the kid taught him. And you really see how he changes the Asian. Second of all, he did a wonderful thing about the golden mean, the whole idea of balance. And he did that with math. It was just an incredible essay. And yes, he got into Stanford as president of the math club, and doing tutor, but it was how he told the story. So this is how you get an edge. You don't get into college. Your story gets you into college. And you have power over shaping your story. You can shape about doing things you're passionate about, not things you think you should do, okay? How do I want colleges to see me, that I have initiative, challenges, that I've made a difference in other people's lives by my generous service. 
that I'm passionate about music or writing. And I've taken my passion publicly and work to improve my skill. So if I have a student that plays the flute or the bassoon, very big this year, you know, what I suggest is, and they work, you know, they're at the high school, they do the marching band. I always say then take it. You want to go to a top school? Then you compete to get into the San Francisco uh, Junior Symphony Orchestra. Pick the top one and you compete because that shows that you've challenged yourself, okay? So, What I suggest is you pick three words that you really want colleges to be able to call you, that you you are, have initiative, that you are passionate, that you are talented, that you are, you love it, okay? The second, the, the, the next principle is that the story that is a significant story has to be credible and has to be concrete. The credibility in concrete is extremely important. In other words, you have awards for what you did. An article was written about you. When the recommender says, this kid made a difference here. This kid changed our school there. Right now I'm working with a student body president. It used to be that student body president was enough. But it's not if you don't have the bottom line, <clears throat> which is the highest SAT and ACT that you're capable of and the most rigorous classes. But even as an SA student body president, you need to make a significant change at the school so that when you leave, they say, this person was one of the best student get a recommendation. Okay. So recommenders need to describe you in those very words. This person has shown initiative. This person always challenges herself. This person goes to the next level. This person um, truly makes a difference. Okay? Now, the other thing is that I want to, I get a lot of students who come to me as seniors, and they show me their list, and they want me to help them last minute with their essay. And the problem is you shape the essay with what you do in high school. Even junior in high school is too late for some students because what all these colleges want is that you consistently did these things. You didn't just do them all in your junior and senior year. And I think people get that now. But I often start working with students from 8th and ninth grade. Now, I don't work with them as often as I do with the sophomores and juniors. The right track. My work is called College Quest. And it really is a quest. Take this road instead of this. Here's a shortcut. This is what makes the difference. Um, and so one of the things I want to talk about is um, just give you a couple other examples. I So about passion. I work with an Asian American student who had top grades, top GPA. And you know what she loved to do? She loved to knit. So we ran with it. You know, we looked at how could she show it as a talent, how could she show initiative with it, and how could she make a contribution with it. And you know what? She got into the University of Chicago on a full scholarship from knitting, okay? Because what she did was she taught mothers, um, pregnant mothers, to be how to knit. Many of them, she had this group where she was teaching them and it helped stress and everything. Then what she did is she started a club at her school and all these different girls and boys started knitting because they wanted for um, poor hospitals, poor mothers, to give their babies blankets. And that's how she did volunteer service. And the talent was she just did beautiful knitting. I mean, we just showed examples of it. It was just incredibly beautiful. Um, So, let me just see. Um, Let me talk about our early action and early decision. How are we for time? No, we still have 32 minutes. Oh, excellent. So, early decision, let me give you a little bit of background. Early decision was started 25 years ago to take the top people in a class, the top 5%, and allow them to, um, you know, make a contract to a college and have an advantage because they did it a month earlier. 179 colleges from Princeton Review, you know, you can have 
you know, um, Stanford doesn't do it anymore, but, you know, you'll have, let's say, um, Columbia. And Columbia will have 18,000 kids apply. They only take 10%. And yet they had, you know, 500 kids who did um, uh, early action, early decision, and 25% of those students got in. You have to understand why they did it. They were stronger students. They were in the top 5%. They were students who had, um, you know, merit awards. They were, they had AP Scholar Awards, and they had the heart that I'm talking about. Now, we don't rank so much in California anymore because of competition, but most kids know if they're the top in their class, okay? I have many, many students that won't listen and do the early decision, even though they're the top 5%, you get a leg up, okay? Because they want you. But if you're in the top 20 or 15 and you just think that a smaller pool will help you get in, that's not true. And what happens is they look at your um, your folder, your portfolio, and all the reasons you didn't get in with early decision, all those little black marks, they see in regular and you don't get in. So early decision is definitely a strategy if you're a very strong student. Early action, there, the only one early action is it does not help you with a foot up. There's no advantage like early decision. But some schools, if you look at the 379 colleges by Princeton Review, they have a little thing that says um, what the college is looking for. And some colleges, they'll have most important, second important, third important. And some schools say interest in the school. Interest. But that's not for top schools. Early action works for Tufts. It works for uh, Boston College. It works for, you know, often people use those schools as a fallback from Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Um, and so that's the only reason. I would not say, I would say, spend your time really developing character. Spend your time getting a story to tell making a huge difference. Spend your time that way rather than trying to do early action, okay? So, um, oh, and I was asked a question about the uh, coalition application. The coalition application is as 54 schools, top schools, that are using it now, and it has a wonderful thing called a locker and um, collabor- a collaboration space. Um, it's really a very good idea. They'll have it up and running, fully started. I want you to really listen to me as a socioeconomic way to fulfill quotas. This is reaching out for, this is what they see in the literature, low-income underrepresented first-generation students. It is not for most Asian students in California. I know a lot of people are rushing toward it, and anybody can do it, but it really is for low-income, underrepresented first-generation students. So there is the common application. There is the universal college application. And now there is the coalition application. You should look at all three of them and see which one is better for you. There's also the historical black college application, okay? Um, You look at those three and see which one's better for you. For many students, the common app is better because it allows you to include a resume. On the coalition, they only let you use two um, extracurriculars. Um, I was asked about the locker is where you, you... put you put awards and you kind of build over the years it's kind of like a um a, a drop box you know where you're putting your things a record in the whole point is just to make it easier for students to get things together so they can apply particularly for first generation underrepresented nobody looks at that locker except you the colleges will never look at it there's a collaborative space where your mentor or if you have a college coach like me or your counselor can look at it you know you can share things that's all it is you can just do the same thing on a dropbox okay so you look at them but i don't see any advantage for asians the only advantage i see for asians is to develop the heart. Do something that you feel passionate about and that it's moving. You know, 
uh, if I could say to every Asian parent, I'd say to them, don't have your kid take piano. <laughs> Unless your kid loves piano. You know what I'm saying? Don't have your – because – Every student I work with either is piano or does flute. And what happens is that kind of um, um, blo blocks each other out. Ha let your child pursue things that are different because then they stand out. Then it's sticky. Okay, let me look at some of these questions that I've been asked to do. Okay. What are the characteristics of your students who have gone to Stanford? Um, I had a student who... Um, had a stroke when he was 10. Um, he taught himself how to become a varsity tennis player, and he taught himself how to um, uh, serve and do a backhand with only one hand. He started a um, nonprofit for kids like himself that have had traumatic brain injury, did it with the help of his dad. And at Children's Hospital, he set up a group for kids that have gone through traumatic injuries like, um, like he did. Now, that is heart. That is a wonderful story. But he couldn't have got into Stanford if I hadn't worked with him to take the hardest, most rigorous classes and get 4.6 and to take the ACT, which he was better at, um, three times and to super score it so he could get up to 31, 32. That's about what they want. So you have people that have heart and they have story, but they don't have what I call the bottom line, SATs. So that's one for Stanford. Another one is... I have a student right now that is being um, courted by Stanford because she's 15 years old. She um, was the most valuable player in the Junior Olympics. She's a water poloist. She just went to the, national, um, the Nationals at 13 um, as a water polo. So it's, it's that kind of thing, outstanding national significance. But you can also get in by story. There's no doubt about that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the adversity that you have a stroke when you're 10. By challenging yourself, by taking on challenging difficulties, by doing a real close-up in your essay that you show how you made a difference, you can get in. And the other thing, of course, with Stanford, those who get in are not applying for computer science because they get in. Um, number, here's the next one. If a student doesn't have any ideas which school he likes the best, is it still wise to apply to an Ivy school through ED just because someone told him it's the right thing to do? Um, no, I wouldn't do that. I would do dream colleges, possibles, and fallbacks. Um, and again, I would only do early decision if I was in the top 5% of the class, student body president, um, award champion, um, varsity player, um, that kind of thing. Uh, here's another one. Is it better to take two science classes in your junior and senior year of the school if the student wants to study science in college? You know, truthfully, if you want to get into a top Ivy League, I'd make sure that you took AP U.S. History, AP English. I would definitely take... Um, AP level biology, AP. What I would do that's much more important is do an internship during the summer or do ATDP or EPGY, which are both for gifted students in science. I would take some courses. Um, I would, uh, what I would say is I know bottom line that Asian students are going to do very, very well in their science courses. How much more interesting to have them do internships and have them do something else. One of the things that I just read recently is that Ivy League are particularly interested in um, Asian Americans who are not only good in science and good in math, but English. They love to see that. Here's another one. In seniors, it better to take one lab science class or the fourth year foreign language class if the student wants to major in 
if you want to go to an Ivy League, you need to do what we call the Golden 25. And that is four years of a language, preferably not Mandarin, um, at, at AP level. Four years of a science, and certainly three of them at AP level. Four years of English and one of mid-AP level. Three years of uh, social science or history, um, and U.S. history, especially at AP level, and uh, government and econ um, at an AP level. So you want to take four of everything that you can, all right? So if you've already taken for lab science, it's much better to take a fourth year foreign language if it's an AP level, okay? Um, how important are senior grades? When do high school counselors send out transcripts to college students, to colleges? Students, they send out all at the end of January to include the first semester of senior year grades, or do they send out according to the individual school application deadline? Um, senior grades are very important. First of all, you want to show that you've continued the rigor that you had in your sophomore, junior year. Everybody knows that the 10th and 11th year is what they use for UCs, and the reason is because UCs has neither the money nor the manpower to look at midterm grades, they're called. Um, too many people apply, again, 80,000 at UCLA. Um, 72,000 at Cal. They don't have the time to do that. So consequently, they look at the 10th and 11th. But if you do private schools, they really are going to look at your first. So, oh, excuse me, let's finish with the UCs. The UCs, what they will do is look at the rigor of your classes, of what you have in, in uh, progress. And if there's rigor classes, then they do. Um, that person will get in over you. Absolutely because they want to see that you continue challenge and go to the next level. Now, with the common app, what happens is, even if you do early decision, um, what they'll show is just in progress what you're taking, um, and then what they'll do is they'll check at the mid-year, and that's whenever you get um, your grades. So if it's, you know, if you finish your finals before, um, January 1st, you get your grades very early, then that's what's going to show. Or if you get your grades in February, that's how they're going to look at it. And they send, the counselor sends a mid-year report with those grades. How important are those grades? Um, if you need your grade point average to go up steadily or, to, you know, or to go up in your senior year, they become very important. If you and don't repeat this, but you can actually have a B or so, because you'll already, um, if it's really a decision, you'll already be in. Um, but you never want to go down in your courses. How important are extracurricular activities, robotics, or debate? Well, since every Asian American student I know takes computer science, robotics, um, it'd be a lot more interesting if they took debate. I'm just telling you honestly. It's all, it's the golden mean. So just imagine, visualize the foundation of a college. That foundation, bottom line, is the GPA and the rigor of that GPA. And it is also your testing scores, okay? And then one essay, one story where they can really get to know you and know you have character. You look at any of these colleges and they all want students. But also imagine a star with the one, two, three, four, five points of the star, okay? So the two arms that go out are the GPA and the testing. But the point really is your talent, your hobby, your passion. The other two points are leadership initiative and volunteer service um, contribution, okay? All of these are equally important. And for Asian students, the extracurriculars are even more important. Since, you know, we have in California, you know, thousands of Asian students, and they all have high. Uh, this is what I want to explain. Everybody's going to apply for Stanford or Cal or um, Princeton or Yale or Harvard. They all have 4.0s. They all have 1,500 or 1,550. That's not what's unusual. 
what's unusual is the quality of their ex- quality of challenge in their lives, how they stretched themselves, how they went to the next level, how they really made a difference. Okay. Um, this person asked, lately there's an article from Harvard and 80 other top universities about new directions for admission. Is it, does it mean that volunteer and community service are more important than those, uh, than those competition ability? I don't quite know what that means. But yes, I mean, again, it's that star that volunteer and community service are very important. The next person kind of goes along with 12. We understand that the top universities admit students not only based on academic achievement, but more so to the passion and heart to serve the community. The interesting twist about this is the recent article, uh, it is now helping the family. I'm just wondering how can admission officers view one activity over others from helping the family versus helping the homeless shelter with the same intensity and the same the, they're talking about the coalition application. This coalition application is for low-income, underrepresented, first-generation students to find it easier to apply to college, okay? And so if you are low-income, first-generation, and underrepresented, they want you to work. They want you to help your family because that's where you've got to start. Ordinarily, and this is across the board. Colleges do not want you to be employed. They want you to contribute and to do volunteer service. And if it was between an underrepresented, low-income student that really helped his family by working versus a homeless shelter where you had nothing to say, no difference, no contribution, then helping the family would be a lot more important. Let me give you an example. I had a student who had a 4.0. Um, his mother had lupus. Um, retired, and he had four brothers and sisters. He came to me because he had no extracurricular activities. But when I spoke to him, I realized that he was the one that did volunteer service in his family by taking his kids, his brothers and sisters to school, by making their lunches, by giving them baths. His mother came, she was a single parent. She came home and she went to bed. His initiative leadership was his role model with his brothers and sisters by him getting those high grades and really helping them with their homework. His talent was working with his family. And that's what he wrote about, and that's what got him in a full ride to UCLA. Um, so it depends on your situation. Now, if I'm talking to people, there's some in the audience that are have a low income, or have first knowledge, then they should definitely use the coalition. Otherwise, I would say just pick the one that works the best for you, the universal application, the common app, or the um, uh, coalition. Pick the one that you can show different sides of you best. Why I like the common app is because not only does it let you write down your extracurricular, it lets you... Um, attach a resume. It also has a um, part where you can talk about any extenuating circumstances. So in some ways you even get to write another essay. So here's another one. What should be brought to an interview when the interview says bring whatever you want to? You definitely want to bring a resume. You, I, mean, I do an awards, honors, and activities resume that is set up the same way that the um, applications, which means it starts with awards and honors. Then the, next, then the next is any particular talent that you have, sports or music, and list that. Then any extracurricular activities you do in your school. Then community activities, okay? And what I would do, like one of my students just went for an interview, and she spent part of her summer in the Galapagos. And she worked with a scientist there and worked with the tortoises. And so she brought some pictures of that. She also works with Girls, Inc., and she helped them. She cares very much about sustainability. She's a vegan. She cares about the environment, so Galapagos really fit. And then she worked with Girls, Inc., um, to with, with a scientist to teach girls about sustainability, and they also grew a garden. So she brought some pictures of that, okay? So you could, or if you do artwork, you could bring some pictures of artwork. But the resume is important because you can have some control over the interview because you know what's on the resume, and they'll ask you questions from the interview. 
to worthy of being included in the coalition locker and what things are not. The coalition locker for the coalition application is merely a space where you can keep a record of your stuff. The colleges are never going to look at it. So it's just up to you. This one says, number, uh, if you win an award or something, is it enough just to put the award in the application or should you put the, the item in the, in the locker too, like an award-winning essay? No. That locker is just to remind you of things and when you're working with your college counselor to help you. Now, almost every college allows you to send in supplemental material. Stanford doesn't want regular supplemental material. They want art supplement, if you have that. But what you can do for Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Cornell and all these Ivy League, Columbia, UPenn, is you can do a supplemental portfolio. And I have my students, the principle is you prep for school with your mind. You apply with the heart. The way that you stand out is by making the Office of Admissions care about you, and they don't care about lists. But if you have a story in which you really move them, and your recommendations back those up, and you have awards that back that up, and you have community recommendations that back it up, then it becomes very powerful. It becomes, and this is one of the things that you want to do to be sticky, you want to be surprising. So if you're an Asian American that doesn't play the piano, but instead um, plays the harp or instead um, dances, does hip hop. I had a student got into UCLA. He used to call himself a Vietnamese hip hopper. Um, if you go the grain so that you're surprising, um, and it's really simple to see who you are, and it's credible, and it's concrete. This becomes very important. This is why these portfolios are important, because they're concrete and they're credible. So you have a resume, and on that resume, you have illustrated every single thing that matters in that resume in this portfolio. So they can see, oh, you got this award. Oh, you traveled there. Oh, you really did this. Oh, there's a there's a um, letter from the Saint Vincent de Paul, etc., backing it up. So that becomes very important. If you work with someone your age, but they were still an authority, can you ask them for a reference letter? No. Is it beneficial to ask an alumni for a letter of recommendation to their school, even if you don't know them? Um, or didn't work with them on a specific project. You know, people somehow think, and that is if your parent went to the school and you gave money to the school, you have a foot up. But let me use the example of Stanford. I remember meeting with some parents who not only gave money, but they both graduated from Stanford. The kids still didn't get in. So they came to me for their second kid. And I said, well, the first kid, did he have a 4.3 average? Was his SATs over 1,500? And they said, no. I said, You've got to do all the things equally that students do. And then you, you get that, that special bump, they call it. Okay? So if you don't know somebody and if they can't write about you in a meaningful way, it's not helpful at all. It really does not help that you may know a dean or you know the chair of the, of the department today. It's just so competitive. What really matters is that you have that bottom line, the highest GPA that you can get, the most, and the highest SAT or ACT that you can do with subject tests, and you've done something interesting. You've shown initiative. You've taken on a challenge and made a difference. You've really made a contribution and impact to your school or your church or your family. And you can write about it in a way that moves us and then you have recommendations that back that up. And you have awards. And you have photographs or an article that backs that up. Okay? This is very, very important. So you can get into Stanford if you do, you know, quietly do a contribution that really makes a difference. If somebody writes an article about it, right? So it gets some a attention. If you don't have a lot of materials to put in the coalition locker, should you just use the Common App instead? The Coalition Locker is simply a place for you to record stuff for yourself. And colleges do not have access in it. 
all the colleges are going to look is the application. Okay? So I think that's about it. Is there anything else? Let me talk a little bit about how I work with someone. I prefer, the ideal thing would be to have a student come to me in their um, eighth or ninth grade so I can get them going on the right, the right direction. But 10th grade is great, and I'd work with them 10th, 11th, and 12th, okay? Um, and what we do, because I have students all over, we'd work by FaceTime, by, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the... Skype. Skype. Um, Skype, cell phone, email, text, and then occasionally face-to-face. -face, or we can work face-to-face. -face. Um, but my job would be to help your child really get accepted from the heart. Okay? All of you that I'm talking to do a great job about getting preparing for the mind. It's the heart we want to look at. It's the story we want to look at. It's making them care. That's what sticky apps apps. It doesn't slip by. It sticks because you care about this kid. You matter. I've had on people's acceptance letters, I've had a PS from the, um, print, the president of the college saying, loved your essay. Your essay brought tears to my eyes. That's the kind of thing. So my website is college-quest.com. I also have a blog, barbaraaustin.com. And so just check it out and see if you're interested in. I love doing WeChat. I would enjoy doing it again. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Austin, I have one more question. And uh, because uh, my son Leo joined the success program in Berkeley, and uh, they have chance the Berkeley, the counselor, ECS counselor, talk about the kids. And uh, they say one thing is every year the application is different, depending on your pool. For example, 2016, the students, you don't know how other students level. Then you can see if you have chance, even you have GPA very high, and, uh, you know, you can see, you need to understand how other people are doing. But at this moment, you know, most students start to prepare their EAED or before the end of this regular year. Do you think what strategy will be different compared with last year? I've been doing this 25 years. I've gotten probably 2,000 students in. I've gotten 100 in, in Ivy League. It doesn't change. You know, there are 4,000 schools, but they're American. They're looking to be moved, to care. They want someone that's very smart, that's shown that. And that's why talent, leadership, volunteer service, it doesn't change. All that I'm doing is refining it. And you know what? The UCs, the UCs are going to say whatever they say, but they, they haven't really focused the way that I have on it. They have changed the essays on the UCs. They have seven now, and you can pick four out of them. Um, but they actually are, they deal with volunteer leadership and talent if you're in academic initiative. I think the thing that has changed is that for right now, Harvard, uh, Stanford uh, are allowing for a few more Asians. Instead of 16%, they're allowing for 20%, and that won't hold for very long. And that it's just getting more and more competitive. There's absolutely, that's the biggest change. So two section you recommend some books. For this time, do you have any new books to our group? Uh, the Princeton Review, I mentioned a couple of times, the best 379 colleges, the 2016 edition, because it talks about what the colleges are looking for, and it's really very accurate. So, okay, we are on time, and thank you very much for everyone in the group. And uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Austin. And uh, most important, I'd like to thank you from Tiamu Group, Tiamu and uh, his wife. And especially, uh, this is iVision. I'm com coming from Tiamu Fifth Group, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, our leader, Vivian. And thank you, Vivian, because she is extraordinary leader for us. And uh, thank you so much. And uh,
We, I am the parent for tenth grade. My son is coached by Dr. Austin, and uh, I am not Tiger Mom, and I want to make sure I still have good relationship with my son during three more years in the high school. That's why my my goal, Leo's goal, is go to UC Berkeley. We have very talented team, and uh, I think. A school is important, but life for the school is just beginning. If the students is excellent student, which school they go, the final destination will not be changed. And I wish you all have the best night. Thank you.